Welcome to the March to a Million podcast with Greg DuPont, founder of the Wealth Solutions Network. In this podcast, Greg shares his journey to positively impact one million lives by creating an army of financially minded attorneys who embrace an expanded role in their clients' lives. Greg and his guests challenge the status quo in the legal profession and the financial services industry and show attorneys how they can improve their lives, provide greater value to their clients, and experience greater professional satisfaction. Join us in this movement and strengthen your business by learning how to solve your clients' most pressing financial problems. Hello and welcome to another March to a Million podcast with your host, Greg Tupont. Now, here's the deal. We're going to talk about something today that's kind of a dirty word. I'm sorry to start the podcast off that way, but but it really is. But the interesting thing is this. When you talk about the benefits of the product we're going to talk about today, 80% of people in the United States want the product. But the minute you use what the product's called, which is annuity, it drops to less than 30%. So why is that? And why is it so important for us to talk about that within WSN? Greg, welcome to the show. Hello, Matt. How are you doing this morning? Man, I'm listen. You're. Uh, I'm super excited to talk to you about this today because I am a huge fan of annuities. I think they are unbelievably powerful. And again, eighty percent of the United States wants them, uh, and so we know that there's a massive demand. So let's break it down for our audience because I think a lot of people who are listening probably are already like, well, I'm not going to listen to this because it's about annuities. Let's break down what is an annuity actually. Yeah, let's be quick before we lose those five people that are listening right now. So, <laughs> so yeah, so you know what I want to talk about today. Yes, uh, annuities is a bad word. We're going to talk about why uh, it's such a charged phrase, uh, and it's something that I had to to work my way through, coming from my perspective as a lawyer and my uh, my training to hate annuities. Right. That's that's that was my perspective. And, you know, as I'm training people in WSN, as we have our our meetings individually and people are starting to get up to speed, like you said, if you if you don't put the label on it, everybody loves the idea. And so the question is, how did it get such a, a an ugly word? How did, how did that happen? Why are there so many people out there that say, I hate it, uh, it can never be good? And you know, and it comes down to a lack of understanding and a lack of proper usage by the financial professionals. Uh, and so when you start to understand what this is all about, then you start saying, okay, yeah, that does make some sense. Yeah. Uh, that was. It was a very, very gentle way to uh, say that there are some people out there who are hawking these uh, because they're a wonderful revenue opportunity for financial services professionals, but they're not always applicable and you have to maintain a specific parameter surrounding this so that you're not breaking any rules. But listen, there are different kinds of annuities too. Do, do you mind? So, so we understand there's been some charlatans out there, uh, but but that's not what you're building with WSN. You're using this as a proper tool to help estate planning attorneys really, truly make their clients whole and prepare for what's next. But let's talk about the kinds of annuities that there are. Yeah. And, and we'll start out in full disclosure, because that's what we do as fiduciaries and advocates. You know, uh, statistically, I'm one of the top annuity producing individuals in the country. Uh, and that's going to get more with WSN. Uh, and that's because I went from a non-believer to a believer. But <laughs> yeah. You have to understand the different kinds of annuities and be able to dissect the criticism. So, you know, annuity, it goes back to a Latin phrase, annuitas, you know, so it goes back to old timeies, you know, uh, it's been around. And, and so why does such a bad thing continue to exist? <laughs> right. That's a good question. Yeah. And so it comes down to understanding the different types. You know, at at first blush, you know, the annuity is what your parents worked for, right? The pension. that they They would end up, they would retire, and they would have the company continue to pay them as long as they would live. And that's, you know, that was the... 
the foundation of the modern retirement era that came along after the post-industrial age. And so things change. We lost that, didn't we? Oh, yeah. And and so what happened? Well, let, let's talk a little bit about that because it just provides context for this whole conversation. You know, what made your parents or grandparents retirement, so those that were fortunate enough, retirements so predictable? Well, they knew they would have that ongoing revenue stream until they passed away. You know, they worked for a union, had a union pension or government pension, those type of things. And that was a good thing. Now, if if they would have called it an annuity back then, then maybe there wouldn't be such a, a loaded phrase right now. But they called it a pension. And so one of the trademarks of that, which often gets now kind of tied into annuities is, well, with the pension, one of the bad things was when you passed away, there was typically, you might have chosen to have it go to a spouse, but there was no asset there for the family. It was gone. And it was, and you were okay with that because the, because the company was was paying your paycheck. You didn't have any money of yours to start with. So when we kind of started evolving out of that, well, the insurance companies had different tools. Well, we have the, a fixed annuity. We have a variable annuity. And we'll talk about a fixed indexed annuity. And so what do these three things do? Well, I'm going to start with the variable annuity. Okay. Because that what that annuity does is gives annuity a bad name. You know, that's, that's the one when you see... Uh, those that shall not be named, but make their living saying, I hate annuities. <laughs> uh, that's what they hang their hat on. When they say that uh, it is expensive, it ties up your money, and it doesn't have the type of growth that you would expect, which are all valid criticisms, mm -hmm. just for the wrong product, in my mind. There, there's still some people out there that will tell you that a variable annuity will be the right choice for that for you. Um, and it may be, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not always the bad thing. And that's the thing you and I've talked about over and over in these conversations. And we'll continue until my last breath that, you know, there, it's not that there are good or bad tools. It's just appropriate and inappropriate uses. Okay. So again, in context, what a variable annuity is, is, it was the industry's response, the industry being the insurance industry's response to the late 70s. And what happened when people had money in fixed annuities and they weren't getting enough growth. So the industry produced and marketed these things that were supposed to give you the best of both worlds. They're supposed to give you the ability to have growth of your asset and then, just like that pension, a payment stream mm -hmm. when you retire. That was the that was the the goal. And to the criticism about cost, well, that ended up being absolutely true. Because what happened with that design was that the insurance company had their own internal costs, the cost of the insurance component, and they also had to pay the mutual funds that the money was invested in. Oh. And so when we look back at some of these things, it's not unusual for me to do a, a back analysis on them and see that, you know, you're paying three and a half percent fees. Oof. And yeah, that's, that is, uh, that's expensive. Uh, and, and most people didn't expect that. Sure. Especially when those annuities don't have any protection against loss. So what we saw and experience is that over a, a good long period of time, those annuities did not grow like they were supposed to because of the cost and because of the lack of protection against loss. And so, yes, rightfully so, annuities earned a bad name. Mm-hmm. But, but again, know, that, that was just one kind of annuity. And I know being a 
annuity, I can't say expert, uh, being a, a person who has much expertise in, in annuities, there are different sorts of new solutions that that were bred out of that, right, Greg? I mean, uh, the insurance companies and, and advisors have been craving this this income stream for their clients with less volatility that happens in the market. And there was a solution for that, correct? Yeah, you know, because um, everybody saw the, um, everybody in the finance and the insurance industry saw on the horizon the rise of the baby boomer, the 401k generation, transition into retirement. Mm -hmm. And the insurance industry realized they did not have a competitive product. And they figured out a product that was more competitive. And that is the indexed annuity, which is the annuity that I tend to use significantly in my practice. Mm -hmm. And the difference between the variable annuity and the index annuity is number one, that cost structure is ripped out of it. So these typically can be as have no fees or one percent, one and a half percent, depending upon the, the bells and whistles on it. Mm -hmm. But that fee that you're paying for, well, that provides for, number one, the protection against loss in many of these, as well as the ability to have that pot of money of yours pay a certain amount of money for the rest of life. And that's the guarantee that you're paying the insurance company for. So this fixed index annuity is an evolution of the annuity that is able to provide reasonable rate of return and protection against loss, which is what so many people that have finished their savings journey are now into my bailiwick, which is where they want to preserve, protect, and transfer their assets, mm -hmm. where this makes an abundant amount of sense to them. Now you use the word indexed. What, what does indexed mean in fixed indexed annuity? You know, we had a conversation uh, with Lawrence Black uh, that we recorded uh, as we as we went into a deep dive on what indexes are and and what index is is it's a reference the the insurance company makes a reference to an external index of of, of market so the most common is the S and P five hundred mm -hmm. uh, an S and P five hundred index annuity will have some amount of the uh, of the growth of the S P five hundred for a period of time as the basis for the index credit, the interest credit that's posted to the account. So uh, we go a little deeper in that, how this basically works uh, to make it easy example is if we had a one year point to point S&P 500 index annuity, that the promise was you're gonna get 50% participation of that growth. Then if between January 1 of 2024, when you bought that annuity, in January 1 of 2025, the S&P 500 went up 10 percentage points, then you would have a 5% interest credit on the account. Mm -hmm. Importantly, if the S&P 500 went down 20%, you do not lose the money that was there before. So you had $100,000 when you put it in there on January 1 of 2023, 2024, index went down 20%. You still have an account value of hundred thousand dollars, January one, twenty twenty five, unless you've got some writer fees. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so that is what makes it a very attractive tool for people that have got the money they need. Uh, they just don't want to lose it. They get a reasonable participation in what's going on in the market. And as we talked about with Lawrence, there's so many different kinds of indexes out there that it, it was, in fact, a podcast all in itself. So uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's another you know, full conversation on how you choose those. But understanding that that tool, that fixed index annuity, has two primary things that we find that the consumers really want to have. And one is that protection against loss. Mm -hmm. And secondly, for those that are not comfortable using the market to generate their income, we have the ability for it to say, all right, insurance company, let's make a deal. When we choose to make that deal, which we don't have to do it with the outset, when we choose to make that deal, we go to the insurance company and they say, okay, for the amount of money you have now that you've accumulated in this fixed index annuity, then we will pay you X dollars for the rest of both of your lives. Does that sound like a good deal to you? 
Yes, great. Now, here's what people need to understand, because this is something I see all the time that people don't understand. It's not like the pension, where there's nothing left over at the tail end. It's only if the deal you've made with the insurance company is so beneficial to you that when you pass away or your spouse pass away, you've been in the insurance company's pocket for a few years that you, there's nothing left for the heirs. Mm -hmm. So as long as you've gotten back more than you put in, plus its growth, then you don't get anything else at the tail end in the form of a beneficiary. Mm -hmm. But if you die two days after you start this process, there's money there. You know, whatever has been paid out, reduced by any of the fees that apply to the payout, and there's beneficiary, um, there's money there for the beneficiaries. Yeah. And most people that aren't familiar with the modern annuity don't know that. So I don't know if you want to go here, uh, but I, I just have to ask the question. And again, maybe this is uh, for another episode, but you talked about the bells and whistles, right? And I don't think people really understand the amount of things that you can um, have as value adds uh, on the annuity specifically. Um, do you want to get into that today or do you want to go ahead and punt that for another time? Uh, we'll just mention in, in passing some okay. of the things that we frequently see on it. Um, you know, the, the annuity, when we, when you're choosing what annuity to, to use for your client, uh, it's, a, it's a process just like to like determining that an annuity is appropriate for your client. Cause now we have to go out to the universe of annuities yeah. to find out. So uh, is this company one that I want to do business with? It? Do, does it have good customer service? Do, you know, do they have a, a history of not changing their rates on clients? Are they uh, you know, rated appropriately for me to be relying upon them to make a long-term promise to my clients? Now, as we look at bells and whistles, you know, we have things like how much can we take out in any given year? Uh, we have things like, Hey, will it pay some accelerated benefits if we have a long-term care situation? I always want to kind of uh, dig a little deeper on that because another thing people don't understand is, you know, they hear that, okay, annuities are expensive and we've talked about that. It's in the context, but they also hear that you lock up your money. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's true because the, because you're making a deal with the insurance company. Yeah. They're going to protect you against loss. And here's the deal. If you need to take out more, then we're going to let you take out within the contract period of that of that of that annuity, then there's going to be pain. So, you know, typically we have like a, let's call it a 10 year surrender schedule. So that'd be a 10 year annuity that if you if you change your mind after year one and you went out of that deal, well, they're going to charge you an exit fee. Typically, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 type of thing. Mm -hmm. As each year goes by, the exit fee gets less. And so if you need access to this money, then it's very important to have one of these, you know, have that as part of the design consideration. So let's say we need to take $10,000 out of a $100,000 contract. Mm -hmm. There are there are contracts out there that will allow you to take 10% out without triggering that fee. Sure. So it's all kind of knowing, oh, this sounds a lot like the uh, regulations. Know your customer. Yeah. Okay. And what are they trying to accomplish with it? Yeah. So <laughs> the every financial advisor I've ever interviewed, which by the way, I've interviewed about a thousand advisors. Um, one of the things that all the financial advisors consistently say is, Matt, you're supposed to invest for the long term, and you're not supposed to make, you know, kind of uh, emotional decisions about your money. And the time horizons that a lot of advisors are looking at are 15 to 20 years, right? That's what you're supposed to invest for. And you're talking about potentially locking up money for a 10 year annuity, Aren't they supposed to be doing that anyway, dude? And the other thing too is this isn't a hundred percent of these person's assets either. Do you mind if we talk a little bit about that uh, before we get into uh, how you make these decisions? Yeah, one of the studies, there are a couple of them that that have been very instructive for me in this journey of my own. Uh, but you know, Ibbotson did a study a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. Uh, and a couple others that basically looked at using 
the fixed index annuity as replacement for bond in a, in a stock bond yes. portfolio. Yeah. Uh, because I think I mentioned on these airwaves, but I'll say it again, you know, the bond fund and the way that it has been foisted upon the consumer is the, the biggest scam from the financial industrial complex aside of Bernie Madoff. Because there are two reasons to invest in a bond. One, if you hold it until maturity, you're going to get your money back. Two, if it's a trustworthy company, you're going to get your interest that they said you're going to get. And with bond funds, which most people have in their portfolios as that surrogate for bond, you get neither of those back. And which is why so many people at their 401ks, they have seen, contrary to what they were told about diversification, that when the stock market went down, their bond investments went down as well. So one way that people are fighting that is by using the fixed index annuity as a replacement for bond. Because yeah. as I mentioned, if you if you keep your annuity for the 10-year period, well, you'll get at least back your principal. And if the market, the index, has been positive in any of those years, you're going to get that interest on it. But don't you buy 10-year bonds, three-year bonds, seven-year bonds? Uh, this is the sort of stuff that just, it just seems so counterintuitive by how a balanced portfolio is already supposed to be. Well, it really, you know, it, it comes down to everybody wanting the consumer's dollar. Mm. And once they get you to believe that annuity is a bad thing, then it's just, money and managers fighting with each other over whether or not I can promise you better return mm -hmm. and money manage. I mean, you, you probably know a statistic on this thing, Matt, because with all the people that you know in the industry, but you know, the investment industry is a turnover replacement industry. It's re X guy says, I'm going to do a good job for you. Mm -hmm. and they piss you off. And then you move to another X guy says, I'll do a better job for you. And so your investment is continually in cycle. Uh, but if you put it into an annuity, well, you got to think twice before you take it out of, and, and change it. And so that's why it predominantly the information out there fed by the financial press is, I hate annuities. You don't want them. They're a bad deal. And to your point, aren't you supposed to be putting money aside, holding it for the long term, letting it grow? which is exactly what the fixed index annuity does during the accumulation side of the game until you say, hey, I got it. I want to start receiving money out the other side for the rest of my life, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is for many of these, another choice that you make. You don't have to do that. If you're happy with it. You can let it continue to grow, mm -hmm. taking money out as you need it. So for many of my clients, we set it up as a volatility buffer. So in a good good times, they can take the money out of the market, take some of their wins off. Bad times, they can take it out of the annuity where they're not taking any loss. And that helps overall. Statistically, it, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I've seen the studies about how that increases the percentage of success uh, in retirement significantly. Well, Yes. And in fact, uh, one of our mutual friends interviewed somebody a little while ago on their podcast, uh, and, and they were specifically talking about how we there is, and I think it's the, the Ibbotson study uh, that talked about the people who do have these sort of products appropriately placed within their portfolios at the appropriate percentages are, are, are faring much, much better. And actually, it's not just percentage wise they're faring better the clients are actually happier with with the overall financial plan okay so we've got two phases we got the accumulation phase and distribution phase you've talked a little bit about that what else do we need to talk about when it comes to annuities for this kind of pocket sized annuity podcast to talk to people about something that they need to know about and definitely implement in as a WSN member well i'm i'm not going to go much more deep into the tool itself i'm going to go into my driving belief uh, <laughs> and what I, I say to all of my clients. Uh, and that is, you know, you, you come to me because you have finished your savings journey or you've done the bulk of it, right? And you don't want to lose money. And 
I happen to believe that history does repeat itself, that sometime in the next handful of years, and I'm counting that under five, there will be a major market disruption. Uh, and you've been through this, Mr. Customer, before. You've lived it when time was on your side. Mm -hmm. But now time is not on your side. So what they feel is they, they can't take another hit of 20, 30, 40% and still live their life the way they want to live it. Mm -hmm. And now if we put some of their savings in a fixed index annuity, then we know we put a floor on that portion of it. However much they're comfortable, we put a floor on it. And if I'm wrong, we give up a little bit of the upside. Mm -hmm. If I'm right, well, we save them from Cat Food City. Yeah. Yeah. There is no other tool that can do this. I got friends of mine that are that are much smarter than I when it comes to the investment management and the risk mitigation, and they've got all kinds of philosophies and tools that they use to to make it happen. And more power to them. Uh, and and I know they're they're doing their best to be the best for their clients, and hopefully they're right. This is the only thing I know that is guaranteed. Right. Well, what a different relationship. Right. So, so when you're sitting down and meeting with your clients and you're reviewing their, you know, their finances and their estate plan, uh, you're not talking about, you know, eking out an extra one to 2% out of the S and P, right. You're not, you know, talking about that sort of stuff. Um, th this, this is control what you can control. And truly, if you're going to do what is in the best interest for the clients, controlling what you can control is probably the best deal. All right. As we wrap this up, what are your final thoughts, final words? I like what you said about control what you control. You know, as as we said in some of the early uh, conversations we had about WSN, mm -hmm. it's about structures. It's about you as an advocate taking that role uh, and coming in from the outside and taking fresh eyes on it and having a conversation with, with clients that, you know, they have been, you know, they've, they're drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, their their experience has been uh, that the stock market does always go up, and over a time it does. But they're heading into a time where if we have two, three, four years that are down, uh, it's devastating when they're using the money. And if you can provide some certainty, well, that becomes the, uh, shall we say, the binding agent of a great client relationship uh, and referrals uh, and satisfaction for both sides. So I've lived through a couple of these uh, much like you have. And I was a coach and a consultant during uh, 2008 ish. Right. And I remember picking up the phone and talking to advisors and they're like, Matt, I, I'm I'm fine. My clients are super happy. I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? Everybody's freaking out right now. He's like, no, listen, I put a purport, uh, an appropriate amount into a fixed index annuity. Uh, and this is how we buffered against what just happened. He said, you know, it, it's nobody wants them until it's too late to have them. Right. And so, you know, we have the same sort of process, the educational process that you do and that you teach the WSN members on how to do this in order to make it so that this is an appropriate component. And I think that's so important for everybody to understand. This is a piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle. And Greg, and you know this as well as I do, many moons ago, people positioned this as the whole puzzle, right? And we know that that's not true. And that's not what you're trying to do here with WSN. So here's the deal, everybody. Uh, you have two courses of action right? The two courses of action are going to be this. Number one, if you want to continue to learn about how to be able to do this for your client base, please just subscribe to the podcast. Share this with other estate planning attorneys that you know, because this foundation, this is the future of being an estate planning attorney. We're just on the forefront of this. We know this, Greg and I both know this. We've been in this for a really, really long time. And number two, if you like what Greg is talking about and would like to know more about how implementing this into your practice, please go to joinwsn.com. Uh, that way you can find out more and more on how you can do it. So Greg, uh, any parting glances before we wrap up today? Matt, thanks for your time and your insight again. 
And thank you for doing what you're doing. Listen, we're on a march to a million here, everybody. The only way that we can get there is by you joining WSN or starting to implement these WSN principles into your estate planning practice. So for Greg and me, uh, Matt Haller, and we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Thank you for listening to the March to a Million podcast. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available and get in touch with our team by visiting our website at www.wealthsolutionsgroup.biz or give us a call at 614-432-8065. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Wealth Solutions Network. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice from qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have.